Today's program is brought to you by Consider Bardwell Farm in Vermont, a producer of award-winning handmade cheese from goat and cow milk. For more information, visit ConsiderBardwellFarm.com. I'm Dave Arnold, host of Cooking Issues. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit HeritageRadioNetwork.org for thousands more. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Greg Bresnitz, and that was Beverly. Uh, big thanks to Leo for introducing us. They will be in studio live later today. But at first, we have, excuse me, uh, Maria Godoy from The Salt. Maria, are you there? Yeah, I am here. Oh, you sound nice and loud and clear. Um, welcome to the show. 
Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Um, we were introduced uh, to Maria from the good people at South by Southwest. Uh, Darren and I will be hosting a series of panels uh, with uh, Heritage Radio Network uh, on March 14th at the Driscoll. And we were connected to Maria um, around the concept of the state of modern food reporting. Um, unfortunately, Maria can't join us, but that gives us an excuse to talk to her on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, Maria, in your, in your own words, can you give listeners kind of a quick overview of what the SALT is and what you cover? Yeah, sure. The SALT is the food blog from NPR, and we cover pretty much the whole world of uh, through the lens of food. We cover uh, the health and nutrition aspects of what we eat, the uh, business aspects, the issues related to the environment, how food production impacts the planet, and issues of sustainability, as well as um, culture, um, how what we eat defines who we are. Um, so really, everything that has to do with how we live um, through the lens of food. Um, and we're going to touch a little bit uh, more on that in a moment, but let's go back to 2011 when the SALT was formed. What was the current state in your in your mind of food reporting um, in kind of relation to the opening you saw for um, the SALT? Well, um, when we launched, we actually uh, did an assessment, and there are something like 10,000 food blogs out there. And so we asked ourselves, well, what are we going to add to that? And what we felt we were adding was um, journalistic rigor to the question of food. There were a lot of people covering food, but more in the recipe, great restaurants, uh, you know, top chefs sort of way. We wanted to address the questions that people are hearing, you know, what, what's the deal with GMOs? Um, you know, is cleansing, juicing really good for us, uh, what about issues related to workers' rights um, and the minimum wage fight, which you know wasn't really actually hitting up then, but that was part of our lens, and, uh, and, and again, the historical and cultural aspects of food. We really thought we wanted to bring um, the same sort of thing that NPR brings to all of its reporting, like rigorous investigation and, you know, skepticism, um, which is like a key tool in a journalist's tool belt, uh, to food, to what we eat. There's a lot of interest. You know, everybody considers themselves a foodie nowadays, and that was true back then, too. But um, as people ask questions about what we eat and where it comes from, we want to say, okay, we're the journalists. Come to us, and we can answer. So what <laughs> and there really wasn't anybody that seemed to be doing that much. Um, now, that said, there, there were some people reporting on uh, – Civil Eats was around already, and right. I have a lot of respect for what they do. Um, they tend to have an advocacy approach to covering food issues, which I think is one of the things that distinguishes us from them. As, like I said, we're journalists, so we bring a lens of objectivity. We try not to be advocates, but just present you the facts, and you can present and you can decide for yourselves. Um, Grist was doing some of this on the environmental front, but uh, their uh, general environmental issues are not really – um, all de solely dedicated to food coverage. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is when they did the climate march uh, last year in um, in New York. I was surprised to see, you know, the minimum wage um, had a, like a section, um, you know, uh, GMOs, like you know, anti GMOs and everything. And I think like it's a, kind of like what you cover there was also really manifested there is that the world is now viewed um, in, as food as kind of like a lens. Um, and how how do you feel that like you know was there any um, kind of indication early on that like you were definitely on to something for this approach? Um, I think the fact that we had a tremendous response immediately, like we launched and three months later we won a James Beard Award, okay. which was That's pretty good. incredible That's pretty and good. Uh, not expected at all. I think that was sort of the first big uh, indicator we got that we're doing the right thing, that we're on the right track, and that people are listening and, and want this sort of coverage. Um, what was the James, and, what article was the James Beard for, or what what uh, subject matter? For, I'm sorry, it was a best food blog. Oh, okay, best group food blog. So yeah. just en mass. Uh, Yes, in mass for just like sort of like best food blog just for everything we do. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I got to tell you that was um, I was kind of like a deer caught in headlights on that stage because I was not expecting it. I did not have a speech prepared or anything, and um, it was. But it was it was a good um, and it, it was a good validation for us that the, the approach we were taking was the right thing to do. And nowadays, of course, a lot of publications are doing this. Um, I should say Mark, Mark Bittman, of course, already had his column in the New York Times, and I think he's done a, a world of good and enlightening um, the general public about 
about these issues. Um, he really helped lead the way. Um, but uh, Tamar Hespal in the Washington Post has a very uh, great food column um, where she tackles a lot of these issues. Um, gosh, I'm, I mean, and then there are other general interest publications that do some of this, too, like uh, The New Yorker. Uh, Michael Spector has done some great reporting on food issues. Uh, Lucky Peach is an, a wonderful uh Publication and then there's gosh there's so much gastropod I'm a big fan of the the um, food um, podcast that takes some of the more tackles more of the cultural issues I'd say but it, with a really smart lens. Um, so is, I mean, is there anything um, before we kind of dive deeper into like what you know you cover? Is there anything that is just you know not on the table or you just try to avoid or you know you say other people do that well we're not going to go down that route. Oh, on the salt? Yeah. Um, I mean, what we don't do, it's funny, people are always asking us when we do stories, like, we don't do recipes, uh, except very rarely, <laughs> and that's partly because everybody else does that. Um, so, and in terms of more serious issues, like issues we stay away from, um, I don't think there's anything we say we're not going to cover that because we're scared to cover it, um, but we want to make sure that we actually have something to add to the conversation. I think that's always, well, that's, that's generally a good rule of like, thumb for any journalist. Uh, when you tackle a story, make sure that, that you're adding to the conversation and helping to bring something to it that enlightens the audience. And, uh, you, know, at, you know, being around for five years now, um, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen that you, know, that you keep returning to or topics or areas that um, have taken on, you know, found you know, uh, a home on the salt? Um, I'm sorry, would you, like topics that we return to over and over, yeah, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think there's always, um, I'm, we return to a, a lot of things. Food waste, actually, is a really interesting topic. I don't think there are a lot of people talking about it five years ago. Um, you know, Jonathan Bloom, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he, uh, he's like a luminary on this topic. He wrote a great book on food waste maybe six or seven years ago. I don't, don't quote me on that. Um, but nobody else is really talking about it. And just in the last couple of years, I think awareness, consumer awareness about food waste, so we waste something like 40% of all the food we produce in this country, um, has really grown. And, that, and that's great. You know, that's, that's uh, a climate issue. I don't think people it didn't even register through years ago, I'd say, or not very much. Um, and now whenever we cover food waste and, you know, the issue of ugly fruit that so much of the <laughs> produce that we, um, that is produced gets tossed because it doesn't meet cosmetic beauty standards set by, by um, retailers, but it's in fact perfectly nutritious and perfectly good to eat and sometimes just really amusing looking like eggplants with faces on them. <laughs> just, great they happen to grow that way. There's a great Nature Instagram is imperfect that. and that's beautiful too. But anyway, that, that's something that people are becoming aware, not, aware of just in the last year that you see like this passion for and and that's something that's that we hit again and again that's pretty new i'd say uh and do you feel that um there are do you feel like you're kind of like a, a channel that people can go to for like you know now food waste but like new issues or using food um as a lens to kind of shine lights on other parts and people come to you with those stories where they might not feel like other outlets will cover Yes, I do think that's 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 the case. I do think people know that we like to take a quirky angle on things sometimes, but not just for quirk's sake, but really, you know, it's like a step back and and connect connect the dots, you know, about how uh what's on our plate affects um, you know, the person who picks coffee in Rwanda or um um it basically, the world the world is act is very big, but it's also very small, and so we like to take stories that connect those dots and and help you see how the choices you make as a consumer have a whole host of ramifications. Uh, great. Well, we're going to take a quick musical break, um, and then we're going to dive into food as a lens for uh, current civil issues. Um, we'll be right back uh, with the salt. This is a song called Barnacles Live from Snacky Tunes. Too deep. Scream. 
I love that song. Laura Stevenson, Barnacles. Uh, Maria, so the, the big thing that I think that um, what the salt does so well and is, is so apparent now is how people use food to frame so many um, civil and civic issues right now, which I think maybe wasn't as much uh, as a focus or a lens before. Um, if you could maybe touch a little bit about how people are using that to frame, you know, in a, a very real and personal way, um, issues that have been around like climate, climate change, greenhouse gases, minimum wage, et cetera. Well, I think um, the probably the biggest issue is meat and meat consumption, mm. like in, in climate change. I think people are becoming increasingly aware of the uh, environmental cost of eating meat, and um, as well as you know, health issues involved. Like the World Health Organization um, issued uh, when they proclaimed, you know, that eating red and processed meats. Uh, could have carcinogenic effects. I think that grabbed headlines around the world. Um, but in terms of climate issues, I think I think meat is probably a thing that people are becoming most aware of in in recent years. Um, I th- in terms of how it's being framed, what I think it's most interesting is how many different publications talk about these. Like again, I said New York Times and Bit- and Mark Bittman would would address these issues, um, and there and there's grist. Too, but um, really, we we get questions about that all the time. When we launched, um, like three or four years ago, we did um, after we launched, we did a series on Meat Week, which was um, hugely uh, hugely popular. And we revisited some of the questions we had conducted a survey back then with um, our partners and um, at Truven, um, which is uh, Truven Health Analytics, and we found that. In fact, there's growing awareness about uh, meat, and people said, told us that they were um, trying to eat less meat, and uh, that's still the case now, although the numbers are a little bit flat. So while people are talking about these issues, um, they are not necessarily changing as much as, um, as we might think. The, the people, about a third of Americans said they're trying to cut back, basically. But so, so this, I think the, the awareness is there, but... Uh, Translating that from awareness to changing consumer habits is not quite happening. I think <laughs> I'm it, not sure if that's what you're asking, though. It, <laughs> no, <ahead>. it <laughs> is. And I, I think what's great is that, like, before, it used to message was like, well, we have one shot, so it's don't eat meat. And it's like, that's the article because that's the space provided. Now mm-hmm. you're seeing, like, a more nuanced thing. So, like, you know, for example, my friend and I um, shared an article where it's like, okay, fine, don't cut out meat. But if, you know, just eat less steak um, because cows are like, it's worse for the environment than, say, chicken. And it's not, you know, it's a bit of a more nuanced article. But since we've read that, I've pretty much cut out steak for, like, the last three months and any type of, like, red meat. And I believe, like, places like The Salt and, like, The Times and all the other places are allowing for more conversation to allow people to dive into, like, a more kind of, like, nuanced and niche conversation that might not otherwise have existed where, like, the real, there wasn't as much real estate. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and the fact is, you know that that conversation is outside of food media, too. I mean, look at Beyonce. She has that vegan meal delivery service, for right. instance. You know, who's <laughs> if, if Queen Bay can't get the message out, <laughs> then who can, right? <laughs> right. But, I mean, it's like it's hit. Like, they made it like, I mean, no one's even questioning, like, the vegan. Like, the world has already been built. So it's now the question of, like, how to act within uh, that world. And the fact that you're right, that she went vegan for a month and they have that delivery service. It's just beyond that conversation. The facts are established. Right, exactly. Like people are becoming more aware, and they're sort of saying, "Well, how do I incorporate this?" You know, and and actually, the survey that we did that we like published recently found that people are, are trying to eat more fruits and vegetables. I think that's that's a trend that um, that sort of reflects ongoing coverage that people are trying to make uh, their like vegetables more of the center of the plate. Um, and that doesn't mean they're necessarily giving up meat altogether, but again, they're just becoming more aware. Um, yeah, so I think the conversation has changed um, dramatically. Um, but again, consumer habits are slow to slow to change but there's adjustments i mean but think of also um like all the uh all the vegan and vegetarian um restaurant concepts that are launching like jose andres chef jose andres is doing um the the new veggie centric chain beef steak you know for instance yeah which is i mean which is great uh are there any stories that you feel are out there right now that um you know are are, that are not getting traction that you think are going to be you know outside of let's just say water critical issues um that will be on the table in the the coming you know months and years (sighs) that is um i'd have to think a little bit more about that um 
I, I, well, well, I don't know that it's not getting necessarily attention. This is this type of thing is not necessarily the the um, w- the, the purview of traditional food media. But I think this is like this is like a traditional issue, um, like the issue the issues related to food insecurity, for instance, like SNAP mm. and and um, the gap that people have and that the benefits don't necessarily help pe- make people um, people. Let me rephrase that. Sure. <laughs> that the benefits don't necessarily go far enough to the end of the month for for people to actually stay fed, so they have to hit food pantries. And there's lots of other data that um, shows, for instance, that SNAP recipients, you know, the program formerly known as food stamps, um, end up in the hospital toward the end of the month too. Like there's lots of correlation. I think people are talking about that. Um, m- not enough, but it is starting to get some coverage. Uh, Roberta Ferdman in, in um, the Washington Post Walk blog has done some good stuff on this. But that's an issue, I think, outside of the purview of traditional food media that could um, could be thought of more. You know, that's that's all part of our food system and, and the haves and the have-nots. Um, Things that would, that's some, some of the issues that we like to bring to light that aren't necessarily the sexiest topics. They're not going to win us in page views, but it's something <laughs> we feel needs to be covered. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and, you know, having a place for that and, and being known for that conversation, like someone else might read about it or pick it up or a policymaker or just to kind of like, you know, change has to start somewhere and it has to be written about in certain locations. And it's great that you cover cover those things because they, they are issues and it, it is, you know, allows people to point to like this is an important issue as not being like kind of in the shadows. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we 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 try to be part of the conversation, and um, and just that's. I mean, I think that is another thing that 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 distinguishes. Well, I mean, I don't want to say that that other people don't do this, but I think that it has been always part of our founding mission is that we want to cover things, regardless, and, and NPR's mission in general, regardless of whether it's going to be popular or an audience favorite. But if we feel it's an important issue, we're going to put it on the table. Um, well, I don't want to talk uh, entirely about kind of heavy issues. Are there any, like, um, some of your more favorite, like, fun food stories? Because there is a joy to food in the world. It's not all negative. Is there anything in particular that you've covered that has put a smile on your face that the readers uh, reacted to uh, positively? Oh, my. <laughs> this is very silly. But when we did a coffee week several years ago, there are um, Japanese latte artists that do these like works of art in foam. And I'm not talking about your little heart or your little leaf, whatever you see at your standard little cafe. I'm talking about 3D art of, you know, like a uh, Portraits of of Einstein or um, or Hello Kitties that actually emerge in foam out of your cup. <laughs> we, I think uh, George Sakai shared that, and we got over five hundred thousand page views on that one page. People really like food art, apparently. Um, that's amazing. Well, I want to thank you for for joining us, and you know, of course, also for all the good work that you do. Um, where can people um, find uh, Salt? Where can people follow you guys? Instagram, uh, submit stories, etc. Uh, share links. Um, well, we are online at npr.org slash the salt, and on um, Twitter we are on at NPR Food, and we are uh, are actually just launching an Instagram. I know it's 2016, right? Well, but we really think about everything super hard before we do it. I mean, if you're gonna, I mean, if you're gonna launch a food blog in 2011, where there's 10,000 others, if you're gonna launch an Instagram in 2016, there's no rush. You gotta have the. Fo- what have you determined without giving away all the secrets? What the focus of the Instagram is going to be, or any kind of like rules of conduct? Oh, that's top secret. Okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, well, thank you so much for calling in. We really appreciate it. Um, we have a song from Midnight Magic coming up, and then Beverly Lee will be live in studio on Snacky Tunes. Great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. 
Today's program has been brought to you by Consider Bardwell Farm. Spanning the rolling hills of Vermont's Champlain Valley and easternmost Washington County, New York, 300-acre Consider Bardwell Farm was the first cheese-making co-op in Vermont founded in 1864 by Consider Stebbins Bardwell himself. Rotational grazing on pesticide-free and fertilizer-free pastures produces the sweetest milk and the tastiest cheese. All of their cheeses are aged on the farm in their extensive system of caves. Consider Barwell Farm is also a big supporter of Heritage Foods USA's No Goat Left Behind program. No Goat Left Behind is a serious effort launched in 2011 by Heritage Foods USA designed to introduce goat meat to American diners and provide a sustainable end market for dairy animals. For more information, please visit www.considerbardwellfarm.com. All right, welcome back. We have Beverly live in studio. Hey, guys. Hi. Hello. You want to introduce yourselves? I'm Drew. Okay. My name is Scott. Hey, how's it going? Really good. We were very surprised that we knew each other. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I did not put the email to the face. Yeah, that's okay. And now we have. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome to the show. Very excited to have you on. I, I played one of your songs like when Leo... Um, uh, like had on one of the other bands and I was like it's always been in the back of my mind to make sure that you came on the show oh thank yeah, you so very excited and good cool. timing as well too yes spring is up around the corner maybe around the corner we're touring the record's coming out good Easy. timing first off you're yeah. rushing the interview okay you're don't just, get to just, the don't just, get to yeah, just, you're, you're messing up the whole thing why right? don't we talk about um, Snacky Tunes instead no, first no <laughs> um, so why don't we get a little history on how things came to be uh, so I started the band, um, it was a side project with me and Frankie Rose, and we made the first record together, mm -hmm. and then she moved to LA, and I just toured it with other band members, including Scott, and we sort of started collaborating more and made the second record together, and that's what's coming out in May. And um, what is it like to kind of go from writing as like a duo to putting a, a band together? How does how did that evolve the songs? We kind of still write as a duo. We've started incorporating like more people doing more live in studio recording. Mm. Um, but I'm like a solo writer, and then we bounce ideas off of each other. I just got like a good vision of you like in a dark room with a candle with like a 
a, pen, a quill and like parchment and being like, no one must disturb my process. Yeah, it's it's usually <laughs> lamb's blood that I'm writing in. <laughs> oh, with it's a classic the, lamb's blood record. <laughs> we just saw The Witch last night. I'm like, so good. <laughs> get something it's new about so it. good. Uh, freaky as hell. Uh, so we good. Thought it was scary because uh, there was debate as to whether or not it was actually scary. Parts were. We were I like, was, how scared? Like, um, 10 for me, I know this sounds stupid, is Talented Mr. Ripley because it's so psychologically yeah. messed up. I saw Blair Witch, like, the first night it came out, and that, like, freaked me out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, like, if, you, if I had waited a week and read anything about it, I would have been, like, not scared, but just kind of, like, the first of that kind of found footage. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought The Witch was pretty scary. Yeah. Without giving anything away, the last kind of, like, 20 minutes are pretty, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty uplifting. Yeah, pretty, uh, pr- pretty great for a Saturday, uh, Saturday night. So in the, so, um, in the writing process, the two of you, but like kind of bringing in a live band, do they throw ideas into the mix or is it like it's mostly fully formed and they just kind of bring in instrumentation uh, into the studio? Yeah, they definitely bring ideas because everyone plays things differently. Like we were talking about this the other day. It's like if you give someone who's a bass player an eighth note, thing to do yeah they'll play it differently just because of the way their bodies do that like it's just it just comes out very personally for each person so right i think people bring different things to someone and just say okay reproduce this bass line yeah and it just seems like the easiest punk rock bass line yeah like three notes just sound different like if three different people (laughs) just do it differently and it's like shocking it just seems like the most straightforward thing but I guess people just there's nuances in how people play. That and when you get rid of. and when you bring the people in, I mean, is it like a hummed out thing? Is it an idea? Do you like? Are you excited about like the nuances that they're bringing to the the parts, or are you, do you hear something in your head and you're like, please just try to get this as close as possible? That's like a never ending conversation, and you always have to feel <laughs> it out every time you do it because in the same. What if you scare someone? What if you witch someone and they yeah. have to? Yeah. They like want to leave. Yeah, that's you true. have to just. Like, Everyone has to feel to, like, included. Sweet talk and, and, yeah. yeah, I think you should come in with um, the idea that maybe they're going to bring something to the table that you hadn't previously thought of, mm. and then you'll find out very quickly if they're bringing something delicious or they're bringing something that's like belongs in another recipe. So when they bring something, <laughs> do <good>. not make <laughs> food analogies because we're on the food show. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. We live for this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, so you find out very quickly whether or not they should like follow a script very strictly, yeah. or whether or not they just get free reign to you know kind of do whatever they want. Yeah, just throw in there. Yeah, it's interesting. How do you go about finding the? I mean, you know, once you and Con- Frankie moved out, Wes, how did you two meet, and you know, how did you kind of form the new iteration? Well, I actually produced um, the first, uh, a couple songs from the first Beverly record, or like played, mm-hmm. you know, and just did some work on them. And then um, when it came time to put the band together, uh, I thought, I, you know, I was in the running. <laughs> yeah, you wanted to do it. Yeah. Really <laughs> uh, and then, like, I, like, just called you every day and, and texted. <laughs> it was like, what, yeah, what, we just, I we had to put it together. Sell, actually. I was like, I think, I was like, I need to, I need to be playing in this yeah. band. Yeah. I think I did that. You're like, um, here's the thing. I have the masters. I'm not sending <laughs> yeah. them. When, I'll bring them to the first <laughs> tour, tour stop. Uh, and then you'll get, you'll get them, like, one at a time until. Until I slowly, like, mm-hmm. Costanza my way right. into the band. It was actually, honestly, during the mixing process for the first record, where you put your foot down very adamantly about, like, a mixing choice. And I was like, whoa, this, it, he's really invested. Like, oh, I think he right. really cares about this. That. And he was right. And it was, like, a great thing. And I'm glad that that's what happened on the record. That's so. amazing. Like, that you... I mean, that's also a fine line as being a producer where it's like, well, you know, it's like, this is how I feel, but ultimately it's your record. But to, you kind of just I went know. for it. I, n- I never do that. I never put the foot down, except I thought... I just felt so strongly about it that uh, I just advocated very strongly on... on for one thing. Yeah. And then it worked out. It was what, what was it? It was, there was two different versions of Honeydew. Mm-hmm. Um, one that had been kind of worked on by a very talented producer, engineer, and <clears throat> he made some changes to it that like improved some things and like lost other things. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the things that he lost were so crucial that it, it doesn't even matter 
if the other version sounds worse, quote unquote, but the, the vibe and like the musicality of it were more present in the first version, like the demo-y version, and I thought that it was very crucial that... Like yeah. yeah. I mean, really I'm glad. sold. Yeah. <laughs> you, you almost kind of, you saw, I kind of saw the fire, like, right behind his eyes. <laughs> right. Like, you're like, you were, like, reliving it. Yes. The, the art. Like, such an strong. easygoing person, yeah. but very adamant about music. And I mean, that's really I, the only thing that I matters mean, to that, either of us, so it's fine. Yeah, I mean, that's what you want in your corner. Yeah, it's great. Right. Um, well, why don't we hear a song? Cool. What are you going to play for us first on that beautiful Martin? Oh, um, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um... I think we're going to play the first song off the new record. Oh. Nobody's heard it. Uh-oh. Snacky Tune. We used to have an air horn sound effect. But <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. What's the Snacky Tunes um, theme song? Is there one? Yeah, there is. Oh. Uh, when you go back, since you were you, you can hear it at the beginning okay. of the episode. Like, Wallpaper did it. Like, Cute. Yeah. Oh, wow. We were going to do, I've told the story a million times, but we were going to, like, <laughs> every month we were going to get a new theme song. We were mm-hmm. just going to get our friends to write it. And then he sent that in and it was like, we we're like, oh, this is perfect. It's, wow. I mean, yeah, anyway. Uh, the only other version of his Freelance Wales came in and uh, covered it. Because they just oh listened God, to it awesome. on repeat in their tour van. So, so they, they like, they're like, we want to do this, we want to do our version of it. So there's like an alternative take of great. that. Yeah. Sounds like a great little seven inch you should put out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah, anyway. All right, so let's hear the song. Um, cool. One.
You know, um, I, I was watching that Martin documentary today. I didn't realize, but Kurt Cobain used Martin in uh, Nirvana Unplugged. Like, almost all of the Unplugged uh, had Martin guitars. Really? Yeah. It's a fancy guitar. I mean, I like they just had them in studio for them to play on. Which, sure. now hearing it, I was like, oh yeah, I just re-listened to Nirvana Unplugged today. And you can just hear that sound. In what I just did? Yes. Great. No, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> exactly. I'm, well, anyway. So, uh, on a sophomore record, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious, you know, what topics and, uh, you know, concepts are you diving into that are maybe different from the first record you wrote? Uh, I think just uh, concepts in general. <laughs> no, I, that, that song is about, um, like, I was writing that sitting at the Williamsburg ro- waterfront, actually, just looking around and looking at sights and wrote a song about it. Which, uh, the one on Grand or where? The where one um, with the, the uh, like, stadium lighting oh, in it, yeah. North 7th. Man, North that's 7th. such a great, I mean, every time I turn the corner of that place, I'm still, like, blown away by the view of the city. Yeah. It's like it's, it's inspiring. You've been in Williamsburg for a while. Maybe you experienced the same thing when they first opened up that stretch of waterfront. Yeah, it was just a big open field. Yeah, and then I came to it one day, and it had a grid of street lights on it. Yeah. Did you were you like shocked and horrified by that, or is that just no big deal? And I'm the only person who cares about that uh, and thinks that's like a, a disaster. I mean, I think I mean I lived on North Fourth and Wythe, so I saw like uh, we lived there, and then we just saw like the development coming. Like right. one day they yeah. put up like stoplights on Wythe, sure, right. or when they changed, I forget it was like Kent or Wythe used to go both ways, and then they turned it into a one way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I kind of just saw that evolve like over time. Mm-hmm. So whenever they do this stuff, I just was like, Ugh. I mean, right. it's just like kind of inevitable. Yeah, uh, and that stuff. I don't know. I mean, you know. There's but like, I wonder if you were, if it was like Central Park, and all of a sudden people went to Central Park one day, and there was just like every thirty five feet there was like a big street light. Like there might be an outcry. Yeah, yeah. I think people would ride, but I think for there, there's like you know maybe there's like the grandfather clause, and this is like mm-hmm. if you're gonna put a park now, you need to have light. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. but I do agree that if you put like street lights in the middle of Central Park, people would like melt, like melt. <laughs> no, I know. I, I'm, I'm like literally. The song is like I'm so ash- just astonished at how fast it changed, and that's mm-hmm. what it's about. But mm-hmm. on the other hand, it's like we need to be thankful that it's not a strip mall. Like it's a, it's actually a park. Yeah. So I that's mean, great. Some, some people would argue that they didn't give us all the park that I was promised for that. Oh, but that's yeah. probably like for another. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for the next uh, show. For, uh, for a next that show. is no, that is true. Record. I mean, it's written. In silly string on Kent and I, North 14th. And yeah, that's that really that's time. that's what's gonna break the break the thing wide open. Yeah, exactly. I, guess, I mean, I guess it's like everyone sees it. It's like we all know that it's a yeah that it's an issue. Um, so besides the kind of like how quickly things change, you know, some of the what are some of the other topics that you've you know gone into for this record? Just change and growing up and friendships changing and there's a lot of just love songs and like uh, yeah. I think change and growing up. That's what it's about. What is uh, like the qualities of a good love song for uh, a Beverly track? Like what's got Honestly, in there? Honestly, I think it's just the, the music and the way that melody and chords go together in a way that is romantic or interesting. It uh, doesn't have to be lyrics for me. Oh, like, just sonically. Just a nice melody that is like kind of um, forlorn and evokes something. That's what I like. You? I, I'm kind of in the same boat. You're I like, think that wow, you could how did take. I do that? Like, uh, if you just grab the lyrics from any love song, like five random love songs, yeah. and just read them all back to back, I think they would all kind of be in the same ballpark. Yeah. But what people did with that was maybe the thing that drove the stake into your heart as a listener. Yeah, it was like the chord progression or just yeah. the way that they sung. Yeah, Those yeah. Because yeah. I listen to my favorite songs that are love songs, and What's I'm your like, and I'm song? like, how did they do that? What you gonna say? Favorite? I won't make. I won't make you choose. But like, what's like top three love song? Well, we've been really into. Um, you know the Elliot Smith, the posthumous Elliot Smith album. Yeah. Um, there's the song "Shooting Star" mm. that I think is like. I guess that's not a love. It's a love song because yeah, it's about it's a about girl like that spurned or like yeah. ex. I w- a breakup song. Yeah. Like you used to love someone. Yeah. But uh, then, um, I I prefer I like Oh Yoko. Oh, that's that's good. a great 
great love song. I uh, we went on like a John Bryan kick and went back and like da- dove back into Fiona Apple and the uh. song like I'll Know, which is like on oh, the second. Oh yeah, the way she sings that song. Don't even it, get like, me started. <laughs> okay, but I'm just like the way, I mean, uh, the way that she she ends that song and you hear her voice crack and you're just yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but like that to me is like I was like okay like. The, like you would have to have like a cold heart to not like kind of just like melt on that song. Oof! It's not even the album closer. There's like another song after that. There's like seven other songs that are just as good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, she's one of my favorites for sure. Um, can we hear another song? Yeah. Should what are you we do play? Crooked Cop? Um, well, n- let's do that. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay. We're gonna need to do some tuning. What's this? Yeah, let, we can just chat. What's this song about? While you tune away. This is a song um, that is another love song. Oh. It's a metaphor about um, someone who can get away with anything, yeah. like a bad cop. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I like that th- I like that this is the theme because spring really is like gonna come to Williamsburg. When spring comes here, it's like a explosion of people and like yeah. hand holding and like public affection, and it's like <laughs> you know. How do you feel about PDA? Uh, if I'm doing it, great. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I think it's Are you like, a practitioner? No. Uh, I don't <laughs> think my girlfriend would let me. No, I was kidding. Um, I think that it's like, it's fine if it's cute, but if it's like gratuitous, it's kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. What do you guys think? I'm like all for it. Okay. <laughs> Less for it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's a weird... If it's yeah, if it's done well, mm-hmm. it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I mean, I do enjoy people like uh, maybe like because of like the nightlife, like seeing people like make out on dance floor, and I was like, oh, right, like kind right. of fun. But people who are just like going at it in like a park in the middle of the day, are kind of just like, eh, I don't know, <laughs> I call think, me old fashioned. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I think that maybe the context where I don't think it's appropriate is if you're hanging around with your friends yeah. and there's like a small group of maybe four or six at the dinner table and then when it happens it sort of creates it, like factions oh. or like divisions yeah, yeah, in yeah. a social setting okay you know where it's yeah. like because no one no one else is you want to be inclusive yeah. when you're out oh so but if it was like a group PDA you'd be fine like if everyone, yeah, <laughs> if every, yeah, yeah. honestly, if everyone did it at the same time, I think that would be appropriate. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let's hear uh, Crooked Cop. That's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <clears throat> Close enough. Why are you making me eat pizza before I sing? I mean, that's the question. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, you were hungry. No one made me. Like, I, I just did it. Okay. Um, you know, hold on. Sorry. Okay, I'm ready. One, two. One, two.
What's the plan for the new record? It's coming out soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's coming out May 6th. We have our release show May 5th with Easy TV and Painted Zeros and oh, Tall Juan. Where is it going to be? At Babies. Of course. I mean, I, I could have guessed. It's like, where's the party? Babies. I mean, babies. They, yeah. they really just, it's great. They've, come, they've been on the show before. They're mm. just amazing. Yeah, yeah, they're my dudes. Yeah. They're the best. The best is when they open up the windows. And like yeah. the whole show, I remember that Dan Deacon show they had, and they just like halfway through the show just open it up, and you're like, oh, this mm-hmm. such a smart design, smartly designed venue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that little wall is genius. Yeah, um, and then are you guys going on tour? Maybe. Mm-hmm. Where are you headed to? So we're leaving on Wednesday um, to tour to South by. Okay. So we're doing U.S. dates in March um, with this band Lazy Eyes, and then great name. Yeah. Nice, nice guys. And then in May, we're going to the UK and Europe. Ooh. And then in June, we're doing the US again. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, any cities you're particularly excited to hit? I've never played in Florida, and we're, we're going to be in Tallahassee in March. Okay. Um, coming up right now. Yeah. And I, it's like, apparently, the promoter's awesome, and it's going to be like a house show. It'll be great. Um, I mean... Yeah, I mean, touring into South By is pretty great. Touring out of South By, you're just probably like, I just want my bed. You're like, I'm going to go home. I know, we have a lot of South By shows. Uh, oh, yeah, t- let's talk about it. Where are you playing? Any any ones you want to call out in particular? Yeah, we, How many we have doing? The, we're doing seven, That's I want to say. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Two, four, five, six. Six? Okay, yeah. six is still great. Yeah. Still, still, maybe yeah. like three too many. Yeah, to be a, honest. Yeah. no, it's fine. It's. I feel be great. like you either do like the one show, or you just like we're down there. Like, let's just pack yeah. it in. I know. I'm so happy that we yeah. got asked to do so many. It's like that's amazing. Yeah. Um, we have the Canine Showcase uh, Wednesday at midnight, and that's going to be awesome. Um, and what else? We're playing like Container Bar for we're for playing, uh, Jan Sport Collide. Yeah. Sure. Uh, doing something with dull tools. We're doing like a really cool, like a Hotel Vegas, like marathon thing. And the OCs are playing. Awesome. Like, I think on the outdoor stage, same day. Yeah. So that'll be great. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we want to make sure we get time for one more song. Where can people find you, follow you, pre-order the record? Everything is <clears throat> at We Are Beverly. Oh, great. That's just everything. Oh, okay. Facebook, Twitter, Insta. Okay. Uh, well, big uh, thank you to Maria from The Salt for calling in today. Uh, hello to my brother and his fiance who are out currently getting ready for the wedding in a few wow. weeks. Yeah, I know. Ooh, Congrats. where's the wedding? It's going to be in downtown L.A. Wow. Fun. Yeah. Um, if you happen to be in South By and you're in town on March 14th, uh, Darren and I, along with Heritage Radio Network and South by Southwest Bites, will be doing uh, five panels from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, at the Driscoll. It's open to all, I believe. We'll be covering stuff like the uh, modern state of food reporting, pop culture and food, the Spice is Right, and a few other topics. Um, uh, flyers we post on Instagram later this week. We'll be sending out some email blasts. Shout out to my girlfriend who did confirm that she would be into some PDA on text message. So oh. things are things are looking up. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Oh. Um, what are you gonna take us out with? We have a little Everly Brothers cover. We're Ooh, gonna do. <coughs> love perfect. theme. Love theme. Um, thanks for coming on. Oh, and, and thank you to Leo as always. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah, thank he, you to he Leo kind of for hooking it up. Yeah. All right. Uh, take us out. It's fine. Yeah.
country. <laughs> talk about food. We talk about music with musical dudes. Finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can email us with questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.